All right, James chapter 1 in our Bibles here tonight, James chapter number 1, and we'll also be looking this evening in uh, James chapter number 5, but we'll begin in James chapter number 1, and then we'll jump over to James chapter number 5. James chapter number 1, beginning in verse number 1, the Bible reads, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into divers temptations or trials or challenges or difficulties, different types of trials. Knowing this, verse 3, that the trying of your faith worketh what? Patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that she may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. And then if you would uh, flip a few pages over uh, to uh, James chapter number 5. James chapter number 5, I'd like for us to begin reading in verse number 7. Notice what James says here. Be patient, therefore. Again, this is verse 7 of James chapter number 5. Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth, and hath long patience for it, until he receive the early and latter rain. Be ye also patient. Establish your, heart, your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth, draweth nigh. Grudge not one against another, brethren, lest ye be condemned. Behold, the judge standeth before the door. Verse 10, Take, my brethren, the prophets who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering, affliction, and here it is again, and of what? Patience. Notice verse 11. Behold, we count them happy which endure. Ye have heard of, here that word is again, the patience of Job, and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. I want to bring a message uh, with God's help this evening with this thought in title in mind. Hurry up and get some patience. Hurry up and get some patience. Patience, Father, please bless tonight as we come to the preaching of your word. Father, may you be honored and glorified in this message as we um, embark upon a new year. Uh, of Lord, Lord, you laid it on my heart to bring this message, which I believe is something that could be preached any time of the year, uh, as all of us are always in need of more patience. But especially as we experience challenges that are unique or trials that are unique or things that just seem to linger on, uh, our patience are tried. And so, Father, please, I pray. Pray you'd bless in this message and help us as your children to grow in this area, please. My hand is raised as desiring for you to help me in this area, that I might be a better servant to you. And I pray all of us would have that same desire in our hearts and minds. For it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The most precious commodity or resource in our country today... Is not, is not a precious metal, some form of a fossil fuel, one of our agricultural commodities, clean air, or even fresh water. The most precious commodity or resource in our country today, I would say, and across the world, is time. That's the most precious commodity. It's time. When you consider, all, consider our dependency upon inventions and innovations that were designed to actually save time. Wash machines, dryers, dishwashers, microwaves, uh, high-speed internet, cell phones, uh, instant media communication uh, capabilities, uh, even the roads we travel on, interstates and highways, express lanes, remote, and then also we have gadgets like remote controls, and uh, it used to be growing up that remote controls were us kids, you know, we were the one, we were like a humanized remote controls to come over to the TV and have to click those uh, dials. Uh, you think about how hard we had it back then. We actually, believe it or not, had to turn the, the TV stations, and uh, some of you might remember there were some stations that now and then you had to kind of even go between uh, numbers to get the station in. And, and uh, boy, those were some difficult times that we had to live in back then. Uh, but now we have remote controls, calculators, computers, laptop computers, and notepads, and on and on we can go. Consider what types of services uh, many are willing to pay for because of time. Lawn care, uh, trash pickup, grocery shopping. I mean, people pay people to go do their grocery shopping. Uh, not, not, I'm not talking 
talking about people that are physically not able to get out. Uh, certainly we understand that, but there are those who just, it's not worth their time. It's, they, it's, they, they would rather just pay someone else to go do their grocery shopping, running of basic errands, laundry services, housekeeping. Uh, believe it or not, you can even pay, there are people that make money standing in line for people. Uh, someone was telling me about that. that some people don't even want to stand in line uh, for different things, and they'll pay people to stand in line for them. Laundry services, housekeeping, tutoring children in school, uh, in their schoolwork, even when both mom and dad are capable, uh, they don't want to spend the time or have the time to do it, so that for them, they'd rather just pay someone else to help out with their kids' homework. Snow removal. Uh, my son wishes that we would uh, farm that out for sure uh, with the snow removal. Uh, I've always kind of felt that that was good father-son bonding time. I've always looked at yard work and, and outside work of any kind. Uh, don't, don't you agree, John Mark? That's just been great father-son bonding. Uh, he's, he's, he's agreeing right now. Uh, oil changes on our, on our vehicles uh, and bookkeeping of one's personal finances. Uh, there are folks that don't want to spend the time monkeying with their own finances. It's not that they're not capable. They don't want to mess with it. They'd rather have someone else balance their uh, checkbook and, and, take, and, and reconcile their bank statements and, and pay their bills. And on and on and on we can go. You can Now today we even have fast food delivery. Please let that sink in for just a minute. That's almost an oxymoron. Fast food delivery. Ladies and gentlemen, it'll be a cold day where the booger man lives before I pay someone to come bring me a Big Mac, large fries, and a Coke. There's no way. Um, there's no way I'm going to pay the, uh, pay the uh, delivery person to bring me uh, something from Wendy's or Taco Bell or Burger King or McDonald's. I mean, uh, I can see a pizza or, or maybe something a little more substantial, but fast food delivery? You know, you can even rent a spouse. Yes, there are agencies that will let you, if you don't want to get married, you don't, you don't have time to get married, and, and you were going to some type of uh, uh, class reunion uh, or some type of event. Now, when I say rent a spouse, you're not actually renting them. And they're not functioning like as a real spouse, like living with you and that kind of deal. But they'll pretend and act like they're your spouse. I believe there are some obvious limitations and things they won't agree to do. Uh, but they'll act in many ways like they're your spouse. You can rent parents. You can rent kids. I mean, this is crazy. You, can, you know, you can rent pets. There are places that will let you rent a dog or rent a cat or whatever it might be. I mean, what have we come to when it comes to saving time? With time becoming so precious, is it any wonder that waiting has become one of the most hated and frustrating experiences that we face in, in day-to-day -day life? We wait in traffic. We wait in lines at restaurants or drive throughs We wait in lines at grocery stores or department stores. We wait at the doctor's office. Uh, we wait in bank lines. It seems like everywhere we go, we hurry up to do what? We hurry up to wait. Have you ever noticed how much waiting takes place at a sit-down style of restaurant? We wait to be seated. Then we wait for the menus. Then we wait to place our drink orders. And then we wait for the drinks to be brought. Then we wait to place the food order. And then we wait for the food to, to come. And then we wait for refills and other basic requests, napkins, uh, sauces, etc. Then we wait for the check. And then, when we, then we wait for the opportunity to, to pay the check. And to think that the restaurant then has the audacity, uh, please get this now, to refer to the one who oversees all of the, this as the waiter. When actually we, the customer in a restaurant, would you not agree? We are the true waiters. Did you hear about the teacher who was helping one of her kindergarten students put his boots on? He asked for help and, and, she, and she could see why. Uh, he was struggling. With her pulling and, 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 and him pushing, uh, the boots still wouldn't go on. They didn't want to go on. But by the time she got the second boot on, she had worked up a sweat. I mean, it was a lot of work to get those boots on those feet. She almost whimpered when the little boy said, Teacher, they're on the wrong feet. Oh, she looked, and sure enough, they were on the wrong feet. It wasn't any easier pulling the boots off than it was putting them on. She managed to keep her cool. We're talking about patience here. As they worked together to get the boots back on, this time on the right feet. 
He then announced, teacher, these aren't my boots. Oh my, oh my. She bit her tongue rather than get right in his face and scream. And here's what she was probably thinking. Why didn't you tell me this? Once again, she struggled to help him pull the ill-fitting boots off. He then said, well, no, teacher, they're not my boots. They're my brother's boots. My mom made me wear them. All of a sudden, she didn't know if she would laugh or cry because once again, she had to put those boots back on. She mustered up the grace to wrestle the boots on the right feet one more time. She then asked the little boy, now, where are your mittens? He then said, I stuffed them in the toes of my boots. Boy, that is what you call having your patience tested. In James chapter number one, which we started to read, uh, it's, it's a lot of patience just going through that story, isn't it? Uh, we notice the Bible says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into divers' temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh what? Patience, as if patience is something very important, as if patience is something that is a premium, as if patience is something that is desperately needed, as if patience is something that we're not uh, complete if we don't have it. Uh, and the Bible goes on to say in verse 4, which does put an exclamation point on this thought and idea, but let patience have her perfect work. Don't resist it. Don't, don't uh, avoid it. Uh, don't try to get away from it. Let it have it per its perfect work or its perfecting work or its maturing work or its chiseling work or its honing work. Uh, patience is so important. And here's why, that ye may be perfect and entire. Now this is talking about as a believer with all the other graces that we have and all the other, uh, other, other, other attributes that we have as believers in our lives uh, that these, the Bible talks about let not your good be evil spoken of and how often the good of a Christian is evil spoken of. Why? Because we lack, what are we talking about tonight? Patience. Perfect and entire, wanting nothing. You know a patient Christian is a praying Christian? So how do you know? You have to be. I mean if you are a patient, of a Christian uh, as we grow in patience, we grow in our prayer lives. A patient Christian is a praying Christian. A patient Christian is a positive Christian. Not, not because it's easy to be positive, but because a, a patient Christian chooses. Now, we're not talking about false positivity, but optimistic, believing that this is going to be okay. A patient Christian is a praying Christian. A patient Christian is a positive Christian. You know, a patient Christian is a principled Christian. They don't live by emotion. They live by principles, by what they know is right and true because they can't trust their emotions. They don't want to want to go by what they're thinking or feeling at any given time because they know better. They're principled. You know, also a patient Christian is a productive Christian. They get things done because they they they're wait, they wait uh, for things to happen. They see things through. Uh, they don't quit halfway through. Uh, they don't expect everything to happen so quickly. Uh, they understand some things just take time. And then a patient Christian is a premium Christian. Uh, they're, 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 there's nothing like them. Uh, patience is, and, and by the way, patience is the final course in God's finishing school. You know, that used to be something pretty popular years and years ago. I think parents would now and then have, in wealthy circles might send a son off to some type of military camp or, uh, and their daughters off to some type of finishing school to kind of give them certain graces or skills or characteristics that they would hope they'd have by the ages of 16, 17, or 18 as they go into adult life. Well, God wants you and I to be productive adult Christians and one of the things that we need so desperately in order for us to be able to be, able to be used to God the way he desires for us is that we be patient. Now let's flip back to James chapter number five. Let me give you just a couple points here, uh, here tonight in this message. Very simple message. Why do we need patience? We find, we find three reasons, at least three reasons uh, here in James chapter five why we need patience. Number one, we need patience to guide us. We need patience 
to guide us. Look at verse number one uh, here as James is dealing with, uh, you know, obviously uh, the people that he's talking about probably aren't reading this. You ever have sometimes you are uh, actually talking to someone and you're trying to help them out with something, but you're actually talking about, uh, act like you're talking to someone else, you know, and, and as if that other person's listening in and gaining some wisdom or gaining some help by listening in on you, uh, as kind of uh, 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 talking to maybe somebody else. That's what's going Going on here in James chapter number five, uh, the first eight verses. I doubt very much that the people that he's addressing here in these first seven or eight verses will ever read this. I doubt they'd ever give audience to this. They would, they would not do it. They'd have no, no inclination. But you and I, uh, who are often troubled by people that just seem like they get by with everything in this world, you and I, who are awful, often troubled by people of greed and people of, of, uh, of ill motives and people of, of uh, dishonesty and those that, uh, that are immoral and rebellious and ungodly. It almost seems like they get by with everything. That they get everything their way. And then those of us who try to live right and do right and, and all of that, we seem to struggle and, and we have to pay. It seems like we are the ones last in line and somebody cuts in front of us in line and, and, and we wouldn't try to ever do that because we're honest people. Uh, but someone that doesn't care about honesty, well, they'll just do it. And it seems like they get by with it. So here we have James really talking to us, but he's acting like he's talking to someone else. Go to now, ye rich men. Weep and howl for your miseries that shall come upon you. He's basically saying, you think you've got it good. Go ahead right now. You, you, you have it your way for right now, but there's coming a day of retribution. Verse number two, your riches are corrupted and your garments are moth-eaten. It won't last. Uh, they, they're, not, they're not built to last. Uh, you, you, your, your happiness and your joy and your fun is going to be short-lived is what he's saying. Verse three, your gold and silver is cankered and the rust of them shall be a witness against you and shall eat your flesh as it were fire. You you have heaped treasure together for the last days. Oh, yes, in this world and in this life, yeah, you've had it your way and you've made your money off corruption and you've taken advantage of people uh, that uh, could have probably fought back against you but chose not to uh, because they live at a higher level of principle. Uh, so you may think you're ahead, but really you're not. Verse 4, behold, the hire of the laborers who have, who have reaped down your fields, which is of you kept back by fraud, crieth in the cry of them which have reaped are entered into the ears of the Lord of Seboeth. Uh, there's going to come a time of justice. There's going to come a time of, of giving an account. And there are people that are going to take the witness stand and stand up against you and, and point you out to the Lord God of heaven. And you will give an account of this in the latter days. Uh, so live it up now. Have fun now. Uh, sure, it seems like everything, you know, because shortcuts always seem to pay off, don't they? Yeah. Oftentimes when you do things right, it takes a little longer. Somebody, you know, does it the wrong way, and it seems like, wow, you know, uh, they just seem to get by with it. So we are tempted to want to, we, we become envious of people that do things wrong. We become jealous of the, the, the apparent success and happiness of people. You know, well, people that go out and just live in immorality and, and live it up, and boy, they just seem like everything is so happy, and their relationships are so good, and, and no problems in the world for a very short period of time. Until, that, until that, that, that sin comes back uh, to haunt them. Verse 5, you have lived in pleasure on the earth and have been wanton. You have nourished your hearts as in a day of slaughter. You have condemned and killed the just, and he doth not resist you. Now, again, you can see what I was talking about, that uh, these people probably aren't going to read that. I doubt the people that are being addressed here are going to look at that and say, oh my, I can't believe he's saying this about us. But this really is for you and me. Because when you and I, are, and, and the people that James is writing to, these were Christians who were, being, who were being persecuted. These were Christians who were suffering for their faith. These were Christians who were patient and were having to go through difficulties and were having to keep their mouth quiet uh, when they, when, and, and instead of defending themselves at times. Now notice how he then turns the corner in verse 7. And now he begins to address the people that he's really trying to encourage. Be, be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth and hath long patience for it 
until he receive the early and latter rain. Be also patient, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. In other words, James is trying to say, yes, for now, it seems as if the bad guys are always one up on us. Yes, it seems for now that those who do wrong, those that cheat, those that lie, those that steal, those that are just uh, uh, careless and reckless and disobedient, they're having all the fun, they're getting all the glory, uh, their dreams are being fulfilled, and you and I, we're having to sit back and just kind of eat crow all the time. We're having to sit back and endure it. We're having to sit back and wonder how are we going to make it. And if I just was willing to compromise, so much of my life would seem easier. If I was willing not to hold my standards so high, you ever feel that way? If I just would drop my standards a little bit, if I would just compromise a little bit, if I weren't so committed all the time, if I would fudge here and give there and, and, and not worry so much over there, uh, how much easier it would be for me and how much conflict there wouldn't be? Uh, and Because uh, uh, it just seems like everyone else is, is having it easy. And what, and what James is saying, that's not true. And patience needs to guide us because we know better. Hey, listen, for the, for the child of this world, this is the best it's ever going to get. This is it. But for the child of God, the best is yet to come. Hey, it's only going to get better for us. Hey, this world is not our home. We're just a passing through. We don't need to be weighted down by the cares of this world to a point where we lose our patience and say, you know what? I'm, I'm tired of doing what's right. I'm tired of living for God. I'm tired of being the only one in my family, some might say, that are trying to do God's will. I'm tired of being the only one in this relationship, maybe a husband or wife might say, that's trying to do God's will. I'm tired of being the only one at work uh, that actually uh, uh, tries to have a good testimony for the Lord. I'm tired of standing out. I'm tired of being the sore thumb at family gatherings. I'm tired of being the one that always has to walk out of the room at a family gathering because things are going on and things are being watched or things are being talked about that we have no business as believers being a part of. I'm tired of being the one going to grocery stores or not being able to go to certain type of stores and always kind of standing out. I, I can't engage in a lot of conversations at work because I don't watch those kind of movies and I don't listen to that kind of music and I don't go to those kind of places. And James is saying... Be patient. Yeah. Be patient. Stay here in James chapter number five. I've got, we've got to read a chapter, and I don't normally read this much of a one given chapter, but we've got to read it. Psalm 73. This is one of the great chapters in the Old Testament to encourage us with this. You know, in our day and time, it's easy just to kind of feel like we're more and more and more isolated away from mainstream life and and, uh, you know, where there's so many others that seem like they're compromising their convictions or compromising their beliefs. They're, they're throwing in the towel with people they shouldn't. And it, it, it seems like, you know, their kids are happier and, and their marriages are going better. And, and they're enjoying the uh, even even going to contemporary type of churches and, and, and bending when it comes to all of that. And you just kind of pragmatically, you know, I, I've known of a lot of people uh, that uh, know better. I know people in their in their 60s and 70s over these years. Uh, that know better, uh, but oftentimes, you know, uh, they, they know to, to be a part of a good, solid Bible-believing church, but maybe their, their children kind of drift away from the old-time religion and, and drift away from, from traditional type of Christianity and, 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 and don't want just Bible preaching and don't want uh, good old time-tested hymns, but, but instead want something that's more of the world's flavor and, 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 and combines both the world and Christianity together, and, and their kids end up going to those kind of churches and, and, of course, that's where their grandkids will then end up going. And, and I've just known so many adults in their 60s and 70s that have raised their kids right uh, the best they could. And all these years have, have done right. And then, and then their, young, their kids kind of go adrift and, and, and get into the wrong kind of churches. But instead of them just staying where they need to stay and being an example of what the, the type of example they need to be, uh, they, they bend and, they, and they, they think, you know what? I'm tired of all the stress and I'm tired of all the battles and, 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 I'm, and I'm tired of all the challenges challenges of the family gatherings and, and not being able to be there with my family on Sundays where we're all together. So what they do, they just say, you know what, I'm just going to close my eyes to this over here and I'm going to close my eyes to that over there. And I'm going to close my ears to all this and I'm just going to make the best of a bad situation. Yeah. You know what those people have given away? Patience. Yeah. Yeah. Patience. Mm -hmm. Psalm 73. Truly God is good to Israel, even to such as are of a clean heart. 
But as for me, the psalmist says, my feet were almost gone. My steps had well nigh slipped, and he was doing what was right, living for God. For I was envious at the foolish. Do you see that? This is Psalm 73. When I saw the prosperity of the wicked, for there are no bands in their death, but their strength is firm. They are not in trouble as other men, neither are they plagued like other men. Verse 6. Therefore pride compasseth them about as a chain. Violence covereth them as a garment. Their eyes stand out with fatness. They have more than heart could wish. They are corrupt and speak wickedly concerning oppression. They speak loftily, verse 9. They set their mouth against the heavens, and their tongue walketh through the earth. Therefore his people return hither, and waters of a full cup are wrung out to them. Verse 11. And they say, How doth God know? And is there knowledge in the Most High? Behold, these are the ungodly. Notice this now, this analysis that the, the psalmist uh, is saying, who prosper in the world, they increase in riches. Verily, I have cleansed my heart in vain and washed my hands in innocency. For all the day long have I been plagued and chastened every morning. If I say I will speak thus, behold, I should offend against the generation of thy children. Everywhere I go, I can't say the right thing, and it's, I'm always saying the wrong thing. Verse 16, when I thought to know this, it was too painful for me. He was getting depressed and discouraged. He was losing patience. Until verse 17. Oh, notice this, please. Oh, notice this, please, in your Bibles. Verse 17. Until, oh, until I went into the sanctuary of God, then understood I therein. Surely thou didst set them in slippery places. Thou castest them down into destruction. How were they brought into desolation? As in a moment, they are utterly consumed with terrors. As a dream when one awaketh. So, O oh Lord, when thou awakest, thou shalt despise their image. Image. Thus my heart was grieved and I was pricked in my reins. So foolish was I and ignorant. I was as a beast before thee. He was ashamed that he allowed himself to be envious of a people whose end is going to be something so terrible. Nevertheless, verse 23, I am continually with thee. Thou hast holden me up by my right hand. Thou shalt guide me with thy counsel and afterward receive me to glory. Whom have I in heaven but thee? And there is none upon earth that I desire beside thee. My flesh and my heart faileth, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. For lo, they that are, uh, that are far from thee shall perish. Thou hast destroyed all them that go a-whoring from thee. But it is good for me to draw near to God. I have put my trust in the Lord God that I may declare all thy works. You know why we need patience? We need patience to guide us. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Not only do we need patience to guide us, but folks, we need patience to guard us. We need patience to guard us. Look at verse number 9 of James chapter 5, if you would please. Verse number 9 of James chapter number 5. We need patience to guard us. Notice the first two words of verse number 9. What are they? Grudge not. Grudge not who? One against another, brethren. Now this is talking about fellow believers. Lest ye be condemned. Behold, the judge standeth before the door. You know, things in life don't always turn out the way we plan and hope. Many times our dreams turn into nightmares and our plans turn into scrap paper. The new job that we were so excited about, better pay, increased benefits, more enjoyable work conditions, more flexible schedule, ends up being very different than we had hoped. The marriage that was supposed to be a storybook marriage with a picture-perfect finish ends up being very different than was hoped. The excitement of parenthood and all of the goals and dreams that are planned in the hearts of the parents so often are shattered. And the teen version and the adult version of the precious baby that once rode home in a car seat from the hospital ends up being so very different than was hoped. The joy of being saved Joining a church, 
serving in ministries, and growing spiritually with fellow believers so many times take unexpected left turns, run into unexpected roadblocks or even dead ends, and involve certain types of challenges and disappointments that end up being far different than was hoped. Things don't always work out the same for everyone, even people that are trying to serve the Lord the same way. The Bible says in Proverbs 13, 12, hope deferred maketh the heart sick. When the human spirit is crushed by disappointments, the tendency can be to abandon ship. Just let it all sink. Who cares anymore? I'm tired of fighting and hoping, only to end up dis disappointed and defeated. I remember I always wanted to get a bicycle for many years. I was a, kind of a late bike rider. I didn't get my first bike until I was about seven years old. Now, by this time, my brother Larry already knew how to ride a two-wheeler, and my, my, my sister Leanne knew how to ride a two-wheel bicycle. Uh, they, had, they had had those opportunities, but uh, as that third middle child, many of you, come on now, that middle child, sometimes we get, you know, table scrap. Am I right on that? Any of you middle child children out there? You know, uh, sometimes it happens, sometimes it doesn't. In my case, it, it just seemed to be that way. And uh, so I didn't get my first bicycle until I was seven, and Larry and Lee already had bikes, and they already knew how to ride, and it just didn't come to come that way to me so we for one year for for uh, we all got bicycles brand new bicycles and uh, I was so excited in my mind I was thinking about just immediately getting on that bicycle for some reason I thought all you had to do is get on it and ride it and it rides I didn't realize you had to learn how to balance that thing I didn't realize it it's just not as easy as getting on it and just taking off and that if you if you don't know how to balance it you fall over and if you fall over it hurts so that first day when we, were, we got our bikes, well, Larry got on his bike, and man, he was gone. He was riding his bike everywhere. He was uh, just going all over the yard, going all over the driveway, down the ditch, up the ditch. I mean, he was everywhere. Leanne got on her bike, and she was doing the same thing. Her and Larry were racing around. They were having a good time and, and just having so much fun. Me? I was still on the kickstand, ladies and gentlemen. I was still on the kickstand. And, and, and they offered to put training wheels on that thing for me. And I said, no way. I'm not putting training wheels on this. You know, I'm old past. You know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just get on that horse and ride it. I probably should have used training wheels. Well, I mean, I was trying to ride that bike and try to balance it. And I couldn't get anybody to help me because they were too busy having their good time. I kept falling over and falling over and falling over and falling over. Finally, I just kind of kicked my bike and I said, this stupid bike. I hate this stupid bike. And I thought, Larry and Leanne, I said, I hate your bikes too. And I hate you too. What on those bikes? I mean, I was miserable. I was jealous. In my mind, I envisioned it being so different. I imagined just getting on that bike and just riding all over the place. And then I saw Larry and Leanne just able to enjoy their bicycles so freely and so wonderfully. And I was jealous. This is not fair. How come their bikes ride and mine keeps falling over? My bike is stupid. It wasn't until I finally learned how to ride that I began to enjoy my bike. And once I learned how to ride my bike, my bike became the best bicycle. You know, that's how we are in life sometimes. Certain things are a little more challenging. And maybe there are some principles and some things in life that we didn't catch on to maybe until a little bit later. And there's some things we're dealing with, some challenges. You know, if we're not careful, we'll look around. We'll see other people's social media posts. We'll look around. We'll hear what other people are doing for their family members and how good things are going and we can't do that and that's not our holidays how we can celebrate and that's not how things are going for us and we begin to develop grudges we begin to develop grudges against even other believers we even begin to despise them This verse almost appears to be out of place in this context until we stop and reveal, review our normal response to persecution and difficulty. What do we usually do when we begin to feel the heat? Oftentimes, we complain to anyone who will listen. 
We might even lash out at each other because of the pressure we are feeling. Again, look at verse number 9. The Bible says, Grudge not one against another, uh, brethren, lest ye be condemned. Behold, the judge standeth before the door. Uh, in other words, he's saying, don't blame your troubles on one another. Don't, do not be complaining about one another. Don't be trying to make yourself feel better by making others around you feel bad. Or don't try to lift yourself up by tearing other people down. You know, there's something about that where there are believers uh, who are frustrated. There are believers uh, who are upset. There are believers and, 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 and genuinely have gotten a raw deal. No doubt about it. But we need patience to guard us. That's not the end of the story. And things always look better across the aisle. Things always look better across the road. Things always look better. Do we not realize that there are people that stage social media stuff? There could be a husband and wife in the middle of a knockdown drag out. And right there on social media, how oh, I love my husband. He cares for me so much. He's always throwing jewelry to me. Yeah. Uh, my wife, she's the best. She's always, you know, serving me supper. Yeah. Now, I know there are people that are like Dear Diary, and they put everything they shouldn't put on social media. Yeah, that's true. But, folks, just because something's on a computer or on your phone or on a tab doesn't mean it's real. Amen. James is now talking about how we are to act toward one another when we feel we are facing difficulties and disappointments. He's saying we need patience to guard us. When pressures mount, there is a temptation to divide. We pull away. We can pull away from our spouses. We can pull away from our children. We can pull away from our parents. We can pull away from our siblings. We can pull away from brothers and sisters in Christ. Impatience with God often leads to being impatient with God's people. See, when we are experiencing the valleys of life, and we look around at other Christians who seem to be sailing right along. How do we feel? What do we say? What do we do? Do we groan? Do we grumble? Do we develop a grudge within? That word grudge gives the idea to sigh with an inner unexpressed feeling. In other words, no matter what our outside looks like, our inside is not happy at all. See, this letter was received by scattered believers, some of whom were suffering more than others. Not everyone was living at the same level of pain. There were some going through worse times than others, and there were people that were getting, getting bitter at that. See, allowing ourselves to develop a negative outlook towards others around us while we face our, our disappointment steals the strength that we need at that time to keep moving forward. Bitterness, jealousy, envy, and anger, they will drain us of strength and energy. See, when you and I are facing disappointments, we cannot afford to be generous with our strength and energy. We can't throw it away on grudges. So we need patience, not only to guide us, but also to guard us. And lastly, we need patience to gird us. We need patience to gird us. Look at verses 10 and 11. Take my brethren, the prophets, who have spoken in the name of the Lord. The subject is still patience, by the way. For an example of suffering, affliction, and of what? Patience. Behold, we count them happy which endure. Ye have heard of the, what now? Patience of Job, and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. That idea of girding means to strengthen us. Patience will not only guide us and not only guard us, but it will strengthen us. It will gird us. Amen. Now comes encouragement from the Old Testament. There have been those before us who have walked the path of disapproval and difficulty. As an example of suffering and patience, James suggests a look at the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. See, Moses had a struggle for many years with a stiff-necked and rebellious people. David was hunted by Saul like a partridge on the mountains. And in advanced life, he had again uh, to become a fugitive through the rebellion of a son that he loved dearly. Elijah's life was sought by the wicked rulers of Israel with vengeful fury. Jeremiah's life was one of continued persecution. And so were the experiences of, uh, experiences of all the men of old. See, it is normally comforting. I don't know why it is, but it is a fact of life. It is normally comforting to feel that others have gone through that which we have gone through or are having to go through that which we are facing ourselves. 
You know, there are at least 11 passages in the New Testament that refer to the persecution of the prophets. And I won't read all of them, but let me give you just a couple. Matthew chapter 5, verses 11 and 12. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you, and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. In Matthew 23, verse 37. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets, and stonest them which are sent unto thee. How often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and you would not. Acts 7.52 Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? And, and they have slain them which showed before of the coming of the just one, of whom ye have not been, not, been now the betrayers and murderers. So, and believe it or not, these are given to us as examples of patience as we go through our challenges. James' point is that the prophets suffered not because they did anything wrong. Please don't miss this now as we're winding things up here tonight. These prophets were not suffering because they did anything wrong. We're talking about Moses. We're talking about David, Elijah, Jeremiah. But because they were doing right. They spoke in the name of the Lord. They were disapproved by their contemporaries, and they were persecuted for their testimonies. Four times in these verses that we read, James calls the recipients of this letter brethren uh, throughout James, the, the book of James. He identifies himself with them in all that he is saying. See, according to secular historians, James met the writer of James, the book of James. This is the half-brother of Jesus. He met with a violent death because he would not denounce the Messiahship of Jesus. He was thrown down from the pinnacle. This is what tradition tells us, that James, the writer of this epistle, was thrown down from the pinnacle of the temple by the order of Annas, the high priest, because he would not denounce the Messiah. Throughout his entire life, James knew what it was like to suffer, and he speaks here to his friends as a fellow sufferer. How appropriate the two examples that James used in verses 7 and 10. He uses the farmer who must be patient while he works for his harvest. He is at the mercy of God's timing and God's resources. He cannot afford to quit doing what he needs to be doing when he faces setbacks and difficulties. And then he uses the prophet, who must be patient while he suffers or experiences disappointments directly related to obeying God and doing God's will. The prophets were men persecuted for their faith, yet they did not shrink from their God-given task and responsibilities. Amen. And notice verse number 11, how it begins. Behold, we count them happy which endure. You know, in other words, we celebrate those that stick with it. We celebrate those who endure. We celebrate those who come through combat. We celebrate those who go through battle and come on the other side. Just like soldiers returning from war, we celebrate them as they come off the plains and they come through the corridors. We celebrate them in parades. We celebrate them, those courageously surviving catastrophes. We celebrate them. See, those that patiently endure are blessed. Those that patiently endure are blessed, a blessing to the rest of us. We celebrate people that have gone through trials we, and, and they're still uh, serving God. We celebrate people. Happy, we're, we're happy that they're in our lives, uh, that have been through some challenges, have been some difficulties, and for all purposes could have thrown in the towel, but they did not. And they're stronger on the other side of their battles. And they're stronger on the other side of their tragedies. And they're stronger on the other side of their difficulties. And they're stronger on the other side of their mistreatments. And they're, str they're stronger on the other side of, of everything that the devil and all this world could throw at them. Those that patiently endure are our heroes. You know, all of us need heroes. There are people around you that need a hero today. Someone who will patiently endure. Do you know that it might be that God is allowing you or I at times to go through something uh, that has taken all the patience that we have to guide us and to guard us and to gird us because there's someone that's going to need a hero. There's someone that's going to need someone to go through that battle that you're through and come on the other side, uh, not just with battle scars, but with victory on their step and to come through a stronger our difficulties and disappointments are real-life opportunities to be spiritual heroes of those around us. I've run out of time. I don't even have time to go into Job. The patience of Job. You know, isn't it true that when someone goes through a very difficult time, we normally say, boy, they have the patience of Job. 
if you read the book of Job honestly, without that in your mind, do you know Job was anything but patient? Job was not a patient man. How many times did Job question? Now, he didn't curse God. But all through the book of Job, he's frustrated. All through the book of Job, he's bitter. All through the book of Job, he's angry. All through the book of Job, he's questioning God. He's struggling. He's, he's struggling. See, God did not criticize Job for being human. But he celebrated this man because he went through all that and went through the valley of all those emotions. And he never lost his heart for God. Amen. He never lost the flame that burned for his devotion to God. You know what Job never did do? Job never did quit. He complained a great deal. He didn't even wish at one time he'd never been born. Yet his imperfections and human weaknesses are scarcely remembered. Only his patience is spoken of. This very characteristic of God's long-suffering towards his saints how terrible it would be if all that God could remember of us were our failings and weaknesses? People tend to remember the bad things about us, but aren't you glad God remembers the good things? The patience of Job. You know, you might be going through the trial of your life, and you might be struggling with something even right now. And if you were to great, see, if you were to go to Job chapter 10, he may not be at an A right there. He may be at a C minus. And if you were to go to Job chapter 13, I'm just, I don't know. I don't know the book of Job that well where I could just say, chapter 13, here's exactly what was going on. You might go to chapter number 13, and he's doing better. He gets a B plus. Then you go to Job chapter 17, and he's doing bad again. Man, this time you give him a D minus. And maybe the next several chapters, wow, Job, you're failing this class. I don't know how many chapters are in Job, but there's quite a few. But aren't you glad on Job's final exam? He gets an A+. Plus. And because Job got an A-plus on his final exam, God said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to throw out all the other scores. And your final grade is going to be your final exam. Dr. Lehman Strauss said, the life story of every man who lives in the will of God, regardless of how much trouble he passes through, must, uh, passes through, must end thus. For we know that all things work together for good to them that love God the Lord, and to them who are the called according, who love God and are the called according to his purpose. See, our trials are not meaningless. Give God time, and in the end, his purposes will be made clear. See, there may be a faith which never in its life complained or questioned, but a still greater faith is the faith, please don't miss this, this is what one Bible teacher said, which exploded in complaints, yes, and was tortured by questions and still believed. It was that faith which held even grimly on which came out stronger on the other side. You know, there are times where you and I know to need, need to know what are our limits. I think in weight training they call it maxing out. What's the most that I can go through? And during that time, maybe we're almost inclined to throw in the towel. But as we stick it out and are faithful to God, believe it or not, we'll come out stronger. My brethren, count it all joy, James said, when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. So my challenge for all of us tonight is this. Hurry up. And get Amen. some Good. patience. Father, we come to you tonight and ask you to please now bless as we have a brief time of invitation. Father, I believe as we go into this new year, as every new year, uh, we need to have patience. We don't know what's going to befall us in the weeks and months to come, but you do. And Father, may we allow patience to guide us. May we allow patience to guard us. And may we allow patience to gird us 
as we go through this year, that at the end of this year in, in December, that we'll be perfect, wanting nothing. Not that we'll be sinless, but that we will have grown, that we will have matured, uh, that this will have been a profitable year, that all the valleys and challenges and difficulties that uh, will undoubtedly be in, in, be all, that we'll all face at different times, Father, will be stepping stones for us in your service. Father, tonight, may we grow in this area and help us with this very important characteristic of, that you want for your children, is characteristics of patience. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Sing two verses of an invitational hymn, Just As I Am. Just as I am. bless you folks. Thank you so much for tuning in and being a part of our live stream service. I know it's a little unusual and, and uh, for, for those who are uh, used to being able to come out, uh, this is uh, exercising our patience. But we hope and trust that the services today have been a blessing uh, to you. We certainly love you folks and cannot wait for us to be able to uh, be, be able to move forward. We trust the Lord uh, in due time we'll be able to do that. We're planning to live stream again this Wednesday at 7 o'clock and then uh, we'll reevaluate again and just kind of check to see how folks are doing as a whole and uh, the goal would be this upcoming Sunday that's the goal this upcoming Sunday ja January the 10th Lord willing to, to go back to in-person services for the nine o'clock early 11 o'clock five o'clock Sunday school and six o'clock that night that'd be the goal there will not be any Saturday meetings uh, this upcoming Saturday uh, on the uh, 9th uh, we hope to pick that back up our soul winning the week following well, again we'll just reevaluate and see where everything is at at that time we certainly appreciate your prayers for wisdom and guidance uh, through this time and that we just trust the Lord and stick together and most importantly, stick with him and let him help us through this time. God bless you folks. Thank you for being a part of the service tonight. Have a great week and God bless you.